Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Hezbollah and how their leader, Hassan Nasrallah, uses the media to craft messages and influence the region. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah has threatened Israel. Nasrallah issued a warning. If war breaks out, Israel will confront tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of Arab Muslim fighters. That certainly sounds like fighting words. But in today's Middle East, appearances are most often deceiving. The Hezbollah leader was threatening Israel in order to make certain that Israel does not intensify their activity against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Nasrallah, it turns out, is clearly worried that a war may be on the horizon. The leader of Hezbollah made his comments in an appearance on TV commemorating El Quds Day or Jerusalem Day, Nasrallah said, the Israeli enemy should know that if it launches an attack on Syria or Lebanon, it's unknown whether the fighting will stay just between Lebanon and Israel or Syria and Israel. Nasrallah continued, I'm not saying countries would intervene directly, but it would open the door for hundreds of thousands of fighters from all over the Arab world and the Islamic world to participate in this fight from Iraq Yemen, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Without realizing what he was saying, Nasrallah has revealed a lot of information. He gave us information we did not know before. We now know that there are fighters from all over the world, the Muslim world, from Iraq, from Yemen, from Iran, Afghanistan, and from Pakistan, fighting alongside Hezbollah as Hezbollah fights against ISIS, and hand in hand with local Syrians defending Bashar Assad of Syria. Iraqi and Yemeni fighters are not that big a surprise, but fighters from Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan certainly are. And now that we know how far the circle has extended, it's not a stretch to say that there are also probably large numbers of fighters from Indonesia and China as well. Thank you, Nasrallah, for spilling the, be the beans for us. The Hezbollah leader is quite understandable that under this pressure, this kind of pressure is starting to make serious decisions. Tensions continue to intensify. We have been watching as Syrians and Hezbollah attack ISIS in the Golan Heights. We know that some of their rockets have inadvertently been landing in Israel, and in turn, Israel has responded with heavy retaliatory aerial raids. It's not just one or two misfired rockets landing in Israel. These were 10 rockets at a time. And Israeli response was not an overreaction. It was a necessary response. Obviously, the Syrians and Hezbollah are trying to prevent ISIS from cutting off Damascus, the Syrian capital. Under normal circumstances, Syria and Hezbollah would go to great lengths not to overshoot and have their rockets land in Israel. But these are not normal circumstances. Syria is under so much pressure from their own rebel fighters and from ISIS that they are just shooting. They are successfully hitting ISIS, but they are also missing. Israel cannot afford to look the other way and permit the situation to continue. To do so would be to enter a slippery slope situation. Neither Israel nor Hezbollah want to engage in war. The last time they went to war, in August of 2006, 1,200 Lebanese and 160 Israelis were killed. The Israeli IDF chief of staff has said that if it were to be a conflict with Hezbollah, Israel would accomplish in two days what it took them 34 days to accomplish in 2006. That might be a bit of an exaggeration. Surely Israel's military ability has increased over these last 11 years. But so has Hezbollah's ability. The Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu told his cabinet that he sees Iran's hand in both Lebanon and Syria and that Israel must make certain that weapons capabilities of Hezbollah do not improve. He said, quote, we also view with utmost gravity Iran's attempts to establish itself militarily in Syria, as well as its attempts to arm Hezbollah via Syria and Lebanon with advanced weaponry, unquote. In a public statement, 
Netanyahu also noted that it has become clear that Hezbollah is manufacturing their own rockets and missiles, that they have received the technology from, uh, from Iran. This is Israel's way of warning Hezbollah that Israel will be targeting those missile factories in the near future. Nasrallah's troops are battle-hardened. Over the past six years, they've been trained by Iran and gained real experience fighting ISIS in Syria. The situation is explosive. A single inadvertent match could ignite the entire region. But nobody wants that to happen. Hopefully, this will remain a war of words and not weapons. Syria added their words of warning to those of Hezbollah's. Syrian President Bashar Assad said, after the Syrian army forces managed to thwart the wide-scale attack of terrorist al-Nusra, the Israeli enemy continued today to attack one of our military stations in a desperate attempt to support terrorist organizations and boost their low morale. The statement continued, the Syrian army general command warns against the dangers of these aggressive activities and lays the responsibility for the dangerous repercussions of these actions on the Israeli enemy. Whatever its excuses may be, the general command stresses it is determined to defeat the terrorist organizations, the Israeli enemy's proxies in the region. The Syrian defense minister, Fad Jassim al frej continued along the same vein by saying, our brave armed forces in cooperation with our allies and friends are more determined than ever to continue our war against the terrorist organizations and smash the illusions of those supporting them. He continued, our fight will continue until we have returned stability and security to every grain of our homeland soil. On a completely different topic, Israel needs computer programmers and they're recruiting them from outside Israel, especially Ukraine. When Alexei Khalimov founded the software design firm called Eastern Peak in Israel four years ago, he knew he would not find the developers he needed at home in Israel. So he went to Ukraine and hired 120 people to develop mobile apps and web platforms for international clients and smaller Israeli startups. Israel is trying to resolve the problem with education, but that takes time. So in the meantime, Israel started importing computer geeks. While the government takes steps to stimulate organic growth of workers at home, it is also making changes to the visa program for a quick fix of importing foreign high-tech workers. For instance, the government is preparing 500 visas for students from abroad who are studying computer science and engineering in Israel at Israeli universities so they can stay to work at tech firms for a year. It's also working on easing the bureaucratic hurdles for the unlimited expert visas. In the meantime, Many Israeli startups are looking abroad. Ukraine is the top destination with about 100 Israeli development centers. A strong tradition of teaching maths and computer science is present in many countries in the former Soviet Union. Uh, the Ukraine has more than 20,000 IT graduates each year. In the 1990s, the arrival of millions of immigrants from former Soviet countries, many of them scientists who went to work for technological companies has also created strong ties. Israeli companies have recruited workers in other Eastern European countries, such as Poland and Bulgaria. Wix.com, which helps small businesses build websites, is one of Israel's hottest tech companies. It employs 120 workers in two development centers in Ukraine and another 80 in a site in Lithuania. Quote, they are in the same time zone, they have a good level of English, and all are Russian speakers. Some of our people here are former Russians, said Boaz Inbal, general manager of Wix Development Centers. We have direct flights to both countries. It's easy for us to collaborate and communicate. The salaries for software developers in Ukraine are about 40% lower than Israel, said Audrey Link, executive vice president at Ukraine's software engineering firm InfoPulse. But he said the key argument in our favor is not the cost but the availability. To find two or three people in Israel is not a problem. But if they need an R&D center for 100 people, it's very difficult in Israel. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. I want to discuss two columns today. Both are from the New York Post. 
First up is a column by Seth Mandel. Mandel is the editor of the editorial page. He was the editor at Commentary Online and even was a guest panelist along with me on Rabbi Mark Golub's roundtable here in this very studio. This column is called The Literary Left's Anti-Celebration of Jerusalem's Liberation. It was published on June 6, 2017 online and in print June 7, 2017. In print it was titled Old City, New Fight and the subtitle was Leftist Literary Elite Tries to Ruin Anniversary of Jerusalem Unity. The column is about how certain people are turning something prideful and miraculous into a curse. This is how Mandel begins. The literary elite is using the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem to make Israel's greatest victory synonymous with tragedy. It's the new Nakba, that being the Arabic word for catastrophe that Palestinians and their allies give to Israel's victory in its 1948 war of independence after Arab governments rejected the partition plan and declared war on the infant Jewish state. Palestinians could have had their own state all those decades ago, but chose war instead and lost. He now explains how liberals have it upside down and turned something nice into something nasty. Mandel writes, There is something utterly nasty in trying to take a rare bright spot on a dark timeline of Jewish history and blotted out with black ink. Yet, this is exactly what Israel's tireless critics are hoping to do with the reunification of Jerusalem, which took place on June 7, 1967. As Israel again fought another defensive war and managed to capture eastern Jerusalem, including the Western Wall, one of the holiest places in all of Judaism. Jerusalem isn't just a place, it's a concept with an importance to Jewish observance that's hard to overstate as is the symbolic significance of the reunification under Israeli stewardship. Mendel now gives a biting example of this craziness, and we can see his point. He writes, This feeling of cosmic Jewish joy is too much for some left-wing intellectuals. The power couple of American prose, Michael Chabin and Ayelet Waldman, chose to recruit a legion of writers whose fame was exceeded only by their ignorance of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and take them to the Palestinian territories in cooperation with a left-wing pressure group in search of Palestinian stories to tell. Now Mandel directly shows how Michael Chabin got it wrong. He writes, He accuses Israel of violating the Fourth Geneva Convention, which he calls the finest flower of the Nazi defeat, comparing Holocaust survivors and their descendants to the Nazis, and he repeats falsehoods like a gullible child, that the water used by Israeli towns is stolen, that Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount was responsible for the Second Intifada, that roadblocks are pointless. And now, Mendel concludes by hammering home that we should be celebrating, not bemoaning, and mourning as Chabin and his colleagues were doing. Mendel writes, What's not pointless, of course, is the timing of this excerpable book. Chabin and company don't present the truth, and they don't pave the way for justice. They are rhetorical rock throwers. Happily, as the liberation of Jerusalem reminds us, Israel has survived far worse. Second up is also a column from the New York Post, and it's by Alyssa Rosenberg. It's called Why Terrorists Love to Target Concerts. It was published on May 25, 2017, and in print on the same day but under a very different title. Terror in Safe Spaces, it was titled. Rosenberg is a cultural affairs correspondent for the New York Post. Here she's writing about terror. Actually, she's writing about terror targets. Terrorists like to target cultural events. This is how she begins. When a suicide bomber detonated explosives in Manchester Arena in the United Kingdom, killing concertgoers as they filed out of the pop star Ariana Grande's show, he joined the particularly insidious tradition of attacks on entertainment spaces. The killers who carry out such acts of terrorism aren't simply launching assaults on Western culture. They're attempting to destroy the particular freedom that comes from surrendering to art, exploiting the very vulnerability that accompanies that surrender. The apparent suicide bombing in Manchester was the fourth major such attack in five years. 
Rosenberg now shows that even in America, terrorists target these centers also. She writes, in 2012, James Holmes killed 12 people in Aurora, Colorado, movie theater. Some of these terrorists have explicitly declared that they intended not only to sow terrorism, but to assault Western popular culture itself. The Islamic State statement about the 2015 Paris attacks mentioned only the Bataclan Conference Center, where hundreds of apostates had gathered in a profligate prostitution party. The group declared the Manchester bombing venue a shameless concert arena. Now Rosenberg concludes that we cannot stay home. We must go out to the theater. She writes, staying home out of fear and refusing to give in to artistic abandon is no victory either. We're all now bracing in the dark of the theater or the club rather than giving ourselves up to it completely. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. Let's discuss five cartoons today. This first is called Al Nori. It is by Marian Kamensky and was published in Austria on June 22, 2017. The cartoon is about how ISIS destroyed the Al Nori Grand Mosque in Mosul. The cartoon depicts the mosque in three frames. The first has it leaning with an ISIS flag on top, the minaret. The second has the minaret with a suicide belt on it, and the third has the mosque blowing up. Next up is a cartoon from Australia, and it was published on June 19, 2017. It's about the car attack outside the mosque in London. It was drawn by Paul Zanetti. Two ISIS terrorists are watching the news report about the London attack against Muslims. One asks the other, are we winning? The second one answers, looks like it. Now, this is very funny and sad at the same time because the message ISIS took away from the attack was that they are succeeding. Next up is a cartoon from the Special Operations Forces report, and it's by Lang. The cartoon was published on June 20th, 2017. The cartoon depicts the ghost of General MacArthur talking to Pacific Rim countries. At the time, they're watching rockets flying everywhere, and each rocket is a different threat, an EMP, a nuke threat, and the ghost of General MacArthur is saying, quote, guess my plan to nuke North Korea back in 1960 wasn't such a crazy idea after all, unquote. This next image is a tweet from the LA Times. It shows how wrong the news can be at times. The tweet is a correction. Unfortunately, it is very funny. And it reads, quote, please note, we just deleted an automated tweet saying there was a 6.8 earthquake in Isla Vista. That earthquake happened in 1925. This tweet was in June 21st, 2017. No doubt, sometimes you get it wrong. But how long does it take to check an earthquake that reads 6.8 on the Richter scale? This last pictoon, or picture with a caption, is from Powerline Blog. It makes fun of the current fight against terror. The Pictoon warns terrorists, beware, we've got flowers and candles, and we're not afraid to use them. In a moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Since the conflict began in Syria, at least 3,000, if not 10,000 Syrians have been brought into Israeli hospitals for treatment. Why would Israel accept Syrians? And why would Syrians want to go to Israel? After all, Israel is their sworn enemy. This is how a fighter from the Free Syrian Army, a fighter named Ramadan, who was shot and badly wounded and went to Israel for help, describes the situation. All the world is killing us, all the world. But all my life, I was told Israel is my enemy. I grew up like that, to believe that Israel is the devil. But all the world is against us, and only Israel is our friend. The world is killing us. Israel is saving us. One of my team had a friend from a village near the Israeli border. So they took me right away. They put me on a donkey. The donkey carried me up to the Israeli border. And then the Israeli soldiers brought me here. Imagine the situation. Sworn enemies. And yet, Israel is saving their lives. Iran has explained their missile attack into Syria. 
missiles were launched from Iran that flew over Iraq and hit Syria. The advisor to the Iranian foreign minister explained the attack by saying, quote, the presence of Americans in the region is illegal. The U.S. should leave Syria sooner or later. He continued, the Saudis and the Americans are the main recipients of this message. The advisor explained that Israel is the main enemy of Iran despite the attack targeting militant groups who Iran blames for the Tehran attacks and adding that Israel now has to worry about its actions. He further explained that Israel must understand that Iran can and actually will hit Israel. He said, I think Israel understood Brockett's message well. He added, we're targeting terrorists only and the countries that support them must know what it means when we use these missiles. Iran's foreign minister, Mahmoud Javad Zarif, called on Europe to use its influence to promote dialogue in the Persian Gulf after Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Bahrain cut ties with Qatar earlier this month. Blaming Iran or Qatar for terrorism is an attempt by those countries to avoid taking responsibility for their own failures in addressing the demands of their own people, he said in the speech in the German capital, which he argued for a new regional security mechanism for the Gulf countries. Quote, one day it's Iran, today it's Qatar, unquote. He continued, it's an attempt to evade responsibility, escape accountability for this very fundamental failure of the state system to address, to respond to the demands of its populace. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has voiced support for Qatar in its confrontation with Iran's rival Saudi Arabia and its allies who accuse Qatar of supporting Islamic militants and an allegation Qatar absolutely denies. A number of government websites, many of them in Ohio and in New York, especially Long Island, have been hacked with a message that purports to be supportive of the Islamic State terrorist group. A message was posted on the website of Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich. It said, quote, you will be held accountable, Trump, you and all your people for every drop of blood flowing in Muslim countries. The governor's wife's website was also hacked. The message left by Team System DZ also ended, I love the Islamic State. According to the New York Post, the same message also infiltrated government websites in Brookhaven, New York. A spokesperson for Ohio's Department of Administrative Services said, all effective servers are offline and they're working with law enforcement. The United States says some demands on Qatar by Middle East neighbors will be very difficult to meet. But the United States isn't rejecting the demands outright. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says in a statement that a list of demands from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates includes major areas that provide a basis for ongoing dialogue leading to a resolution. He's calling for Qatar and other Arab countries to sit together to work through the list. Tillerson is also calling for a lowering of rhetoric to help ease the tension. He says the U.S. is supporting Kuwait's efforts to mediate. On a fascinating note, Alon Day became the first Israeli driver to compete in NASCAR. He competed in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, the sport's highest league of competition. Racing in the car with number 23 for the BK Racing Team, the 25-year-old from Tel Aviv, named Israel's Athlete of the Year in 2016, finished 32nd out of 40 at Sunday's race at the Sonoma Raceway in Southern California. It was a tough race for newcomers in Sonoma. Day one, the, NAS, uh, the NASCAR Whelan Euro race in England on June 11th at the Brands Hatch and was planning to return to Israel after that race, then got a call to compete at the Sonoma Raceway in California. Day grew up in Ashdod, where he learned about NASCAR from playing video games such as Grand Prix Legends. In his early days, Day became a champion of the country's only semi-professional motor sport league, go-karting. His father realized the son's potential and sent him to compete in Europe. He became racing in Formula 3 and was on his trajectory towards Formula 1, among the top racing leagues in the world. But a couple years ago, Day decided to switch gears. He shifted from driving Formula 1, which is an open cockpit style of car, to stock cars, ordinary cars that have been modified to be raced in the NASCAR. It was mostly a business decision, 
The world of motor racing is driven by sponsorship. Since Israel's business ties with the U.S. are much stronger than those with Europe, they recognized that he had a greater likelihood of being sponsored to drive for NASCAR. It's definitely much easier for me to get sponsorship here in the States than in Europe, he said. In an unorthodox manner, but typical of this generation, Day has done most of his training on computer screen simulators. Israel only has one uh, motorsport racetrack, and it's to open early this year. The track designed for car and motorbike racing is located in Patzel in the Jordan Valley and is expected to open in September. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the Six-Day War transformed Israel and the Jewish world? Before the Six-Day War, it was assumed that at any moment Israel could be wiped out and destroyed. The Six-Day War gave breathing room to Israel. The transformation caused, the six -day war, caused by the Six-Day War reached even to the anti-Zionist and ultra-religious Jewish movements. Even they saw the Six-Day War as a transformation and as transformative. Many of the ultra-Orthodox recognize how important it was to have won the Six-Day War. That is when the Jerusalem uh, city was reunited and the Kotel and the Western Wall returned to Jewish hands. The ultra-religious and the anti-Zionists might reject the state, but they certainly embrace and even celebrate the idea that Israel was victorious against all odds in 1967 and reunited Jerusalem. They are correct. They, the entire paradigm, changed because of it. We cannot imagine what Israel or Judaism would be like without the Kotel and the Western Wall and Israel's miraculous victory in June of 1967. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.